So we're in this sermon series called The Jesus Way. It's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I am just so grateful that the words of Jesus have been preserved. The sermon that he gave that defines the whole way to have a relationship with the Father. And we have that, and we get to hear it, and we get to, to, to take it apart and understand that his way of approaching God is so completely different than the way of religion. That God doesn't want you just to have religion. In fact, you don't need a church, you don't need religion, you need a real relationship with God. And so the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' vision of what life is supposed to be like. I believe with all of my heart that what religion does is it reduces something that's so beautiful and turns it into something mechanical where we're so worried about all the time, here's what I gotta do and here's how I have to behave and we get caught up with the rules and the regulations of it and we miss the whole heart of God. So the Sermon on the Mount, I, I can't, I can't retrace everything that we've done, but we've come to the middle part of it. And in your message notes, if you'll pull that out, I actually gave you the entire first half of the Sermon on the Mount on one page. It's like a little review, which I'm not gonna preach today, but if you'll give me three minutes, I will just help you. For those of you who are just coming on board, let me give you an overview of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he, he sees the crowd coming and immediately he says, we have to climb higher. The crowd won't climb, but disciples will. And what I've been begging you to do is if only, I can't make you do this, I'm just a pastor, I have no authority over your life, but if I could just say, would you climb higher, would you elevate, will you separate from just the way the crowd does things and just try to get a little closer to him? And if you would, if you'd follow, Jesus will sit down with you and he'll explain his way. So there are nine beatitudes that he begins with. Beatitudes, nine, nine ways of the heart. If you focus on behavior, you'll miss the point. He says, if your heart's not right, <laughs> nothing will be right. So in Matthew chapter five, verses three through 12, he gives nine beatitudes in three sets of three, and they go like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, I bless people who realize they need God. And blessed are those who mourn, who look at the world and go, something's got to change. None of this is working. And then their humility of the meek who say, wait, it's not the world that needs to change. I need to change. Then the next three. I, I bless people who hunger and thirst after God with all of their heart. He's not looking for people to add a little religion, but people who go after God with their whole heart. Which, by the way, if you do, for one year, you will not recognize yourself a year from now. Just go all in. But the problem with going all in is that it can very easily turn you into a self-righteous person. Like, I don't know what all these other people's problems are, but look at how good I am now. And self-righteousness is very ugly, so that's why he says you gotta remember the mercy that you received. <laughs> the mercy you needed, that's what you have to give. And God says, I bless the pure in heart, people that have, they've given up on the hypocrisy of pretending that they've got it all together, but they're still in need of God. And the third triad, which is, I bless people who work for peace. This whole world is tearing people apart, polarizing people, dividing people. So I bless the people who actively work for peace, even when it costs them something, even when they're persecuted. And when they're persecuted, I bless people who choose joy no matter what. And then he moves into the next part of the sermon, which is, I bless the people who realize that they're not here to consume, just be here for themselves. I bless people who will be salt and light. Like, you're not just here for yourself. The church's mission is to impact the community and make a difference in the hurting of people. That's what Serve Day is all about. If we don't help people, if we don't serve people, if we don't make a difference, we've missed the point. And then he says about the past and about the Bible, don't think that I came to abolish the Old Testament or the Bible. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And that's a whole message all in itself you'll have to go back and listen to. Then he switches and moves into the way we treat other people, our relationship with others, our relationship with our own heart, with our anger, with our lust, with, with the, the people in our lives, the, the enemies that we have, how we're supposed to go the extra mile and turn the other cheek and pray for our enemies and challenging messages. I mean, if you think that Christianity is like, just, just accept Jesus in your heart so you can go to heaven when you die, that's some version of what is being expressed today that has nothing to do with the way of Jesus. His way is so much more elevated. 
In fact, once you realize that the goal, this is where Jesus summarizes his first, really 27 things that he said in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, here's the whole goal of life. Be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And if the goal of life is to be morally and spiritually perfect in all that I do, in other words, I am whole, I am complete, I'm undivided in my devotion to God and his way, then I can stand with my shoulders back and my head high and look at the thoughtful people of the world and say, I'm not following after some weak, compromising, uh, easy believism religion. Oh no, I, this is not easy, it's not simple, it's not trite. This is something worth going after my whole life to pursue. No other system in the world demands that I should be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. So having said this, where Jesus says, to be perfect means to be undividedly all in with God with all of his attributes. All of us say, well, who in the world can do that? I'm so glad D Jesus did not end the message right here with be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, let's go to lunch. Don't you hate sermons that tell you what to do but not how to do it? I used to hate that as a kid. Pastors would preach these sermons and they would say, you gotta do this. And I'd be like, okay, well, yes, but how? I didn't know what to do and I was frustrated. And Jesus does not frustrate. He's, he's, everything he said, he's laid out the vision of the life God wants, but now he moves into the practical part where he's gonna say, and here's why this doesn't happen in people's lives. Of course you can't be perfect. Because there are nine bad attitudes that are built into the heart. You didn't know this. There's not just nine B attitudes. There are nine bad attitudes that Jesus reveals in the coming verses all the way through the first six verses of chapter seven where he says, here's why this doesn't take root in your life. Religion can't, can't accomplish these things. These things, you, you, you're, there's things going on in the heart that resist the way of Jesus. So Jesus is gonna take some time and break it down. Actually, they come in sets of three, just like the Beatitudes. So over the next few weeks, I'm not gonna take nine weeks to talk about nine bad attitudes. I'm gonna spare you, I'm gonna do it in the sets of three, okay? So we're gonna do three today, three next week, and the last three the week after that, where I explain to you, here are some obstacles that are inside of you, the nine bad attitudes that keep us from following after God. And they all have, they have, the first three have a theme. They are divided motives. Because if the goal of Jesus is, is to make us whole and complete and, and no, nothing fake about us, then there are some things inside of us that are pulling against being whole. Like on one hand, do you remember the, 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 first, the first beatitude is, Blessed are those who recognize their need for God. All right? Well, here we go. <laughs> I almost, I'm laughing already. Take heed that you don't do your good deeds, your religion, your charitable acts before others <laughs> to be seen by them. It's like he wrote this for 2023. <laughs> this is the whole world today. It's about, I don't, if, if it actually, if it isn't seen by others, did it really even happen? If it's not on threads, I mean, is it even real? Is it not on social media? Is it, did, it, did it occur? And we're living our lives to show people what we're doing. And Jesus says, that, that thing that's inside of you, like, do you really want to give and do good because you want to get close to God? Do you need God? Or are you just trying to look good for other people? If, if you're just doing stuff to be seen by others, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Let me draw out that little phrase, to be seen by them. I see three people at, at work in the world today, and the first one is the selfie Samaritan. <laughs> the selfie Samaritan. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good, but I gotta have you all know that I'm doing good, and I'm posting about it, and I'm, I, it happened this week, I don't know if you saw this, but it blew up TikTok where this, this woman in Australia, it's a bizarre video where she is cleaning a beach and it's filled with trash and so she's walking with these big 
trash bags and she has her little media crew filming her while she fills the bag, giving an Oscar-worthy performance because what she doesn't know is there's a regular person just on the beach going, look at this, and that person's filming it and he's giving this little commentary like, it's not even windy out here. And she's like, Ugh, pushing against the wind. And she's like struggling with the wind, but she's filling up those bags. And then when she gets a few bags done, she does a little victory dance like, look at me, I've done good for the world. And then they stop filming and then they leave all the trash bags on the beach. And the dude is like, hey, I've been watching you. <laughs> Why'd you leave the bags? And they just sort of blow him off and keep walking, walking, leaving the bags. Whatever was degradable is now inside of a plastic bag left on the beach. Doesn't that make your blood just boil right there? The selfie Samaritan. You can find it on YouTube yourself. Bizarre. But that's the way people are today. It's like, I, I want to do good, but only if you see me. Are you, is there a little bit of a selfie Samaritan on the inside of you like there is me? Oh my gosh. The other person is the VIP volunteer. <laughs> the VIP, y'all like my little alliteration today? The VIP volunteer is the one who shows up to serve, but they didn't really want to serve. They just want to be seen serving. And I expected you to be ready for me. Like, it's hot out here. Did you all bring water for me? Like, I, I came, but I expect to be treated a certain way. Like, don't you know I'm serving? Treat me right. Well, yeah, but we're helping poor people. Yes, but it's about me and about who's watching me. There's an attitude. Don't show up at surf day and be the VIP volunteer, everybody. That's why I'm saying this today. But you know what I'm talking about, the VIP volunteer who, who really thinks it's about them when really they should be just serving others. And then, of course, the third person is the fake philanthropist, which I had to spell that way to work in my, my literation. The fake philanthropist who's, who's more interested, you know, in the moment with the big check than they are about actually doing good. And here's the thing. We see through all of this now. Like, this used to be something people could pull off. But we see the selfie Samaritan. We see the VIP volunteer. The, the, the Gen Zs are like, we see the fake philanthropist. They're turned off by it, which is why people are so turned off by religion. Because they see the fake. Aren't you tired of it, everybody? And that's why Jesus is saying, if you try to, you can, it's a good thing to give, but if you try to approach this where, do you really need God? Or do you really need recognition? And Jesus starts off with, if you're going to get involved with following me, with religion, at a certain point, doing good in the world is going to come up. And what's your motive? Motives matter. That's why Jesus goes on to say, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, don't post it on threads. Don't post it on Instagram. Don't, don't sound a trumpet like everybody. <laughs> <laughs> However they really do that face. <laughs> don't do that because the hypocrites are doing that and they love to stand in the church and in the streets that they may get glory somehow stop it assuredly I say to you whatever reward they got for that that's it that's all they got that's it God says there's no reward for you when you do a charitable deed <laughs> It's like he wrote this for right now. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Like, stop the self-promotion. You want to do your good. See, see, this has no regard for the dignity of the person you're doing it. I saw, I literally saw this downtown. I saw a person giving some money to a homeless person with their phone out. I saw it. I'm like, dude, you think that guy wants that? What is, what is going on where we feel like, I want to do good, but I need people to see it? God says, do this in secret. Your father sees what you do in secret, and he will reward you openly. This is where Jesus is saying, okay, how, what is your approach to God? Is it like, do you, do you, I need a little God, I need a nice church, I need a group to belong to that will elevate my brand a little bit? No, 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 no. Do you actually need God desperately? Do you want to be close to him? Do you, do you want, are you going to trust him to reward you? Jesus is going to talk about our relationship with money a lot in the next few verses because money is this God. 
And he says, you can't serve, you can't serve both. You're going to have to choose who's going to be the master, who's going to take care of you. God blesses the one who says, I desperately need God. And we're going, yeah, but I'd really like to be recognized for the things that I do. And let me just pause here and just say this. Your, your giving is a reflection of your spiritual maturity. No doubt. He's not, he's not saying that you shouldn't give. You, in fact, it's just expected that giving is what you will do because you're a human being. You're a person that is made in the image of God who is, by his very nature, a giver. He gives life to us. God so loved the world that he, you know this. He, so you're made in his image, so it's in you to be generous. So it's not that you're not going to give. The question is, is what are you, what's your motive for doing it? But you've got to become a giver, because if you don't, it, well, well, your giving says something about your spiritual maturity. Now, I try to learn everywhere I go. I go to a church, I see how they're doing things, I watch other leaders, I take pictures, I try to say, I wonder how I could become a better leader myself. This is a picture I took in Chicago at a church that I visited, and it's called, <laughs> Will a Man Rob God? And they had this in the lobby, and they had the non-tithers board, and there's the list of all the members. <laughs> Was I on the south side? Oh, that's cold. That's cold. Real church. Can you imagine shaming people like that? Like, we're going to list out who the non-giving members are. Let me just put you at ease, and you will never see a board like that at Harlan Church. Okay? Unbelievable. The non-tithers board. But, okay, it is a sign of, of immaturity, though, when we don't give, because all, the only people who think that everything in their hand is for them are about three years old, like my grandson, who lives his life right now. He operates by the child's law of ownership. You ever heard of this? It's a real thing. The child's law of ownership is if it's in my hand, it's all mine. <laughs> it's not, I don't share. It's all mine. If I can take it away from you, it's mine. If I had a little while ago, it's mine. I love this one. If it's mine, it must never appear in any way to be yours. <laughs> if I'm building something, all the pieces I need are mine. And if it even just looks like it's mine, then it's mine. Now that's fine when you're three years old. But there are some people who are full grown and this is still the way you operate your life. You think everything that's in your hand is for you. Yes. And that's just, that's, it is a, it, your giving is a reflection of your spiritual maturity. Which is why when I'm looking to put people in charge of God's house, if I'm looking for spiritual leadership, hiring a person, looking for a pastor, looking for people I'm going to entrust with the resources of the church, I look to see how they handle giving. It's problematic. If a person has not learned this lesson and they don't give, their giving is nothing or nominal, that's a problem. Because the Bible says if you don't know how to manage your house, how will you ever manage God's kingdom? And so I'm looking for people who understand that God has a system and an order of how he expects, because God expects his kingdom to run this way. This church has to run according to God's way. Amen. So not everything that comes to this church is for this church. We believe that. So we, like today, the offering will come in, 10% will go right off the top. It's not, it's not ours. We're going to give that all away. And then we're going to take another 10% and take that out and say, we're going to save that for our future. Get out of debt quick pay off our mortgage. We're going to take another 10% and we're going to call that strategic margin so that we're prepared for whatever comes. So in a year like this year, when we built a budget off that 70%, but the church grew 81% this year and there's 600 new members and now there's more need and more people coming to us with needs in their lives. We've actually given 14% of our, of our giving away. We, we, we went over in our giving budget because of the needs of people. We weren't freaking out. We had margin. I didn't have to do a fundraiser, do the non-tithers board. I didn't have to do 
I didn't have to resort to none of that stuff that people do. Because when you operate your life, you should live your life that way. If you, if you realize not everything in life is for me, and some of it I'm going to save for my future, and I'm going to live with some margin, I'm not going to commit every dollar that comes in. You would live with so much peace, and you could do what's really in your heart, and you could bless people. Amen. You wouldn't have to fake it and show, you know, selfie acts of generosity every once in a while. I really am a giver. You know, you wouldn't have to do that. <laughs> Let me say it again. Not everything that God brings into your hand is for you. That's why I do think, I check, I look to see if I'm gonna give somebody spiritual responsibility in the lives of others, I wanna know that they have learned this principle because I wanna know that they're generous. You think I'm kidding? When a boy came and asked my daughter to marry my daughter, my girls knew from when they were little, you know what I'm gonna ask them you know I'm gonna check their tithing record. And they'd go, ah, oh, dad. And I'd go, look, let me just say, if <laughs> my, my new son-in-law, who I admire greatly, is sitting right there, and we had this conversation, and I checked. And I was so glad to see his generous heart because I'm, I'm gonna give the most precious thing I have to somebody who knows that God is first in their life. I make no apology for that. I want to make sure, do you know that not everything in life is for you? I, I can tell the selfishness of a person's heart. So I can see, I want to entrust the most precious, valuable things that God ever gave me and my daughters to, to young men who know that God is first in their life and know how to order their, man, their money. God's got a great future for them. That's, that's what I want you to have. We are blessed, the Bible says, to be a blessing to others. And if you are not blessing others in some way, you're missing what God wants. So Jesus comes right at this and he says, you're supposed to be a giver. I'm not knocking your desire to be a giver, but check your motives. Let me show you another verse. It's not in your notes, but Jesus is talking about how important this is that you have money in your life to help people who can never do anything for you. If everything has to have an ROI for your benefit, you're missing the way of Jesus. Jesus said, when you give a special dinner, don't ask your friends, your brothers, your, your relatives, your rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. This is talking about quid pro quo giving. Like, I'll give if I can get something back. I'll invest if I make sure that my brand looks better. I'll give if some... I give if there's a return, and he's saying right here, when you give, you've gotta have a heart like you're giving it to God, and you're giving it for the poor. Look what he says, give to the poor, give to the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. God will take care of you. God will repay you. He'll repay you at the resurrection. He'll bless you in all kinds of ways. This is at the heart of God. Who are you really trusting? Do you need God to take care of you or do you really need the recognition of others? Let me summarize this for you. First, first bad attitude is, is my life about selfie generosity <laughs> or selfless generosity? It's a great motive testing question. So that's the first piece of the divided motives. Then he says a second thing about divided motives. He goes on to talk about prayer. What could be more religious and holy than prayer? When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of streets, here it is again, that they may be seen by men. This is so important. Are you praying to get close to God? Are you praying to bring yourself into submission to his will? Or are you submitting your spiritual resume to other people? Is this about what, how other people will... See, there's a lot of people praying stuff that they don't even know. It's not even their words. They just heard somebody else say it, but y'all been in church a long time. Y'all know the, the cliches that are out there? <laughs> y'all are liars. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. Y'all know exactly the, the cliches about prayer. I kind of come over to this side of the room. That side, <laughs> and I want to be real. When people pray, and they say all these things in big flowery words, and you're like, who are you trying to impress? Are you trying to get close to God, or are you just trying to show all of us that you know a lot of scripture? <laughs> 
When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogue, in the church. When you pray, here's what you ought to do. You ought to just learn how to pray in private. Have a real relationship with God. Develop a communication with him where God knows that you've been talking to him. Listen, don't do in public what you don't do in private. That's not in your notes, but that's good. Somebody should write that down and tell me that later. <laughs> when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who's in that secret place, and your Father who sees what you pray in secret, He will reward you. Look what He says about the cliches. And when you pray, you don't need to impress God with vain repetitions. Eugene Peterson, in the message paraphrase, he says, and when you pray, don't turn it into a big theatrical performance. What do you think, God sits in a box seat <laughs> and you're on a stage? Stop, stop acting like that. Just go talk to him like a normal person and tell God the desires of your heart, the needs of your life. Therefore, don't be like them with their many words. <laughs> For your father, watch this, knows the things you have need of when? So don't call up God and go, oh Lord, today I pray for sister so-and-so who's in the hospital. God's like, really? What? <laughs> Shut up. When did that happen? <laughs> you don't have to, you're not informing God of nothing. He knows. What you ought to do is don't, don't, don't worry like, is it God's will to heal? I don't even concern myself with that. I just go, God, I pray for the healing. I, I pray my desires. I bring my needs. I know God's going to do what he's going to do. He's the Lord. He knows what to do with it, but I'm going to bring him the honest, sincere desires of my heart like he's my father and I'm his child, like he's my father and I'm his beloved son. This whole thing, Jesus is saying, stop trying to do religion and come with me. Climb higher, elevate, get close to me. Therefore, he says, pray like this, and then he goes into the Lord's Prayer, which I don't have time to teach you today, but I'm going to come back at the start of the 21 days of prayer, and I'm going to teach you how to pray powerful prayers that move the heart of God, not pompous prayers that people pray for the benefit of other people. So this is the question. This is the summary that you want to fill in your notes here. Is prayer just about being a pompous you know, um, presenter of great words so that others will hear and go, wow, that guy knows how to pray. Or are you just trying to get close to God? Powerful prayers. And I'm going to teach you how to do this in the 21 days of prayer. I want you to understand the heart of this. The 21 days of prayer is not a show. It's really, we spend most of the time in private individual prayer, just pr pr privately praying. There's a little bit of time when we pray together, but most of the time I'm bringing you into a practice that I do 365 days of the year. I get up at 6 a.m. and I spend time with the Lord and in his word and I, I get close to God. And all I'm doing for 21 days is I'm bringing you into that personal practice. There is nothing like having a real, vibrant relationship with God where he speaks to you at the start of every day. And I want you to join me. I want you to get up, set your alarm, plan, to join me for the 21 days of prayer, and I'm going to teach you how to get close to God. And if you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. So again, this is not some show. This is actually how can I learn to put a practice in my life? You know what they say? 21 days, new habit will start. So I want to help get this habit in you that of daily private prayer. So he's talked about prayer, he's talked about giving. Let me give you one more. He talks about fasting because prayer and fasting always go together. When you fast, notice he never said if you give and if you pray or if you fast. Did you notice? When you do it, like this is what you're supposed to do. When, when you do these things, don't be like the hypocrites who show up with a sad countenance. What does that mean? Well, you know I've been fasting for like 40 days. <laughs> It's been hard. I'm so hungry. But just pray for me. Because I want you to know that I've been fasting. Stop doing stuff like that. Like people who look weary and tired and how are you doing? Oh, it's been hard. I'm fasting. No. He says, because that's the reward. If that's all you want is for people to feel sorry for you and see what a holy person you are, great. You got it. But he says, if you really want a reward from God, when you, when you fast, 
anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men. Don't let them even see that you're fasting. Like, get ready and get dressed. Put all that on if it takes you 45 minutes and then walk out. I don't need 45 minutes. I only need like 30 seconds. That's why I have this little short haircut. <laughs> not that I mind that you take 45 minutes. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm going to stop talking about that right now. <laughs> but whatever you have to do to do you, do that when you're fasting and show up with a smile on your face. I don't have time to teach you about fasting, but why fast? Well, because the body is telling you what to do all the time. The body is saying, you need this, you need that, this craving, this thing. Take matters into your own hands, do this. And for a season of time, you're gonna say, I'm not listening to what the body says, so I'm gonna tackle like even food. I'm gonna limit that to humble myself to God so that God can tell me what to do. And just maybe after that 21 days, I, don't, I can actually live without the body calling the shots and telling me what to do all the time. So when, when you really wanna get the attention of God, it's not like God's gonna be so impressed with your fasting, it's just what it does to you. It just, it humbles you, it quiets you, you shut off these impulses and the drives that are controlling us all the time and for a period of time we say, God, I just wanna get close to you. I want you to feed me, you be my bread, you be my life, you be my source. When the Father sees you coming like that, He's going to reward you. He's going to, I can't explain what it does, but when you fast and pray together, like this 21 days of prayer, God does something powerful when you put prayer and fasting together. But not if you just use it to show people how holy you are. So I would summarize this attitude with this question. Are you going after God with your fasting or, or any other act of devotion that would lead you into self-righteous religion? Or do you really want a sincere relationship with God? That's what this is all about. The way of Jesus is not religion. Some of you, all you have seen is American Western Christianity that's got so much religion, so much about do this, don't do that, laws, rules, and none of it is drawing you close to the heart of God. When God is always after, just leave the crowd, elevate, climb higher, start walking with me, recognize your need for me. You know something's got to change. <laughs> yeah, I need to change. Okay, well, go all in. If you would just go all in for a year of your life, you wouldn't recognize yourself. You couldn't even explain how it happened. I don't know. I got close to Jesus, and he changed my life. Do you, do you need any more self-righteous religion, or do you need a real relationship with or let me, let me summarize this whole, these whole three points. Do you recognize your need for God, like you actually need Him? Or are you just living life trying to get other people to see you? Maybe that's what's driving so many people crazy today, their sense of insignificance, their need to be on a screen, their need to take a selfie, their need to project. Like, I got there has to be something more than just what I'm experiencing. There is! You need a real relationship with God, and if you would draw close to Him, He'll draw close to you, and He will fill the longings of your soul. He knows how to heal trauma. He knows how to put things back together. He knows how to help you forgive. He knows how to help you uh, soften uh, a hard, hateful spirit. He knows how to change your heart. No religion will ever do that. Some of you desperately need a real relationship with God. And I wanna invite you into that. I'm not asking you to join a church or to be more religious, but I wonder if you would just take this journey and just get close to Him. I wanna lead you in prayer. Would you just stay still for just a minute? Don't move for a quick second. I wanna give people an opportunity to respond to this message. I want to lead you in a prayer, especially for those of you who feel far from God today, or maybe all you've ever known is just church, religion, you've known about God, but you don't really know him, or maybe you did a long time ago, but you've never gotten close to him before, like I'm talking about. I want to lead you in a prayer. You don't have to join the church or come to the front or do anything. I can pray for you right where you're sitting, but I can't pray this prayer for you it's a prayer you have to pray for yourself. And so bow your heads, close your eyes all over the room. Let's give people a moment. 
Do you recognize your need for God today? How many of you would say, I need a real relationship with God? I've, I've never lived with him. I've turned away from him. Or maybe I need forgiveness. I, I was close one time, but I've turned away. I need to come back today. How many of you would say, Pastor, that's me? Would you just lift a hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me today? Yes, 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 yes. All the way up in the top, I see. Anywhere else, you just would say, just, just as an act of humility and an act of agreement with the Holy Spirit, just lift your hand up. Yeah, I see you right there. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I see you. Love that. Love it. I'm not in a hurry. Anybody else would just say, I need a real relationship with God. This is for you. Respond today. Lift your hand. Yeah, I see you, sir. Awesome. Yeah, I see you, ma'am. I see you, sir. Here, just say these words. I'll give you some words, but you pray this sincerely from your heart. God, I know that I need you. I know I need you. I'm so sorry for living without you. I'm sorry for trying to do things without you. And I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed and the messes I've made. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Jesus, I believe you are the way. You're the truth. You're the life. And I want to follow you from this day forward. So I invite you to come into my life. Say something like that. Like, come into my life, Jesus. I surrender to you. Or maybe say it this way. Jesus, I just give you my whole life today. I surrender. Holy Spirit, I pray every person, wherever they're sitting, whoever's watching online, praying in their own living room, touch their soul today. Begin to heal them. You are the restorer. You're the redeemer of things that are messed up. I pray that as they start to follow you and get close to you, a year from now, they won't even recognize themselves. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, everybody. Give God praise today. So beautiful. So proud of you.